A reading from John's sixth chapter. Those who eat my flesh and drink my blood abide in me and I in them. Just as the living Father sent me, and I live because of the Father, so whoever eats me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven, not like that which your ancestors ate and they died. But the one who eats this bread will live forever. He said these things while he was teaching in the synagogue at Capernaum. When many of his disciples heard it, they said, This teaching is difficult. Who can accept it? But Jesus, being aware that his disciples were complaining about it, said, Does this offend you? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit that gives life. The flesh is useless. The words that I have spoken to you are spirit and life, but among you there are some who do not believe. For Jesus knew from the first who were the ones that did not believe and who was the one that would betray him. And he said, For this reason I have told you that no one can come to me unless it is granted by the Father. Because of this, many of his disciples turned back and no longer went about with him. So Jesus asked the twelve, Do you also wish to go away? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. This is the Gospel of our Lord. Dear friends in Christ, it's a privilege to be with you as a part of this morning's worship and to be able to give your dear pastor some much welcome relief. Our rostered ministers have been doing such a wonderful job over the course of the past year and a half, but it's hard work and we need to do everything we can to give them our encouragement and support and I'm glad to be able to help in this small way. In today's epistle and gospel lessons, we are provided with some incredibly rich and evocative images of what it means to live a Christian life. They are also challenging images that have been understood in different ways throughout the church's history. Today's epistle from Paul's letter to the Ephesians reads as follows. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God so that you may be able to withstand on that evil day and having done everything to stand firm. Stand therefore and fasten the belt of truth around your waist and put on the breastplate of righteousness. As shoes for your feet, put on whatever will make you ready to proclaim the gospel of peace. With all of these, take the shield of faith, with which you will be able to quench all the flaming arrows of the evil one. Take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the word of God. I must confess that I find the martial uh, militarized language of this text difficult. It may be that I've been overly sensitized by my summer's reading of the full five-volume, 5,000-page-plus 5 Game of Thrones series. As fun as it's been, I've pretty much had my fill of breastplates, helms, swords, and shields. But I'm also quite aware of the destructive ways in which Christian people have seen the life of discipleship through militaristic lenses. The images of battle and conquest have been used by Christians to engage in evil acts that are completely at odds with the gospel of Jesus, the Prince of Peace. And as such, we need to be extremely careful in how we read and express such imagery. I'm heartened, however, that the passage is framed with the counsel that we arm ourselves with whatever is necessary to proclaim the gospel of peace. 
That is the real point here. And although the imagery used is all about arming for violent battle, the real strength that is advocated is not the might of armies, but rather the world reconciling power of the Prince of Peace, who himself was the victim of a violent and oppressive regime. Certainly evil exists, and yes, we need to combat evil, but we do so by arming ourselves, not with weaponry, but with the virtues of righteousness, peace, faith, and the word of God. <clears throat> Hence, I find it really helpful to read this Ephesians passage alongside other discipleship descriptions employed by Paul, such as this passage from his letter to the Colossians, where he writes, as God's chosen ones, holy and beloved, clothe yourselves with compassion, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. Bear with one another, and if anyone has a complaint against another, forgive each other. Just as the Lord has forgiven you, so you also must forgive. And above all, clothe yourselves with love, which binds everything together in perfect harmony. Today's gospel likewise holds a few theological pitfalls of which we need to be careful. This is now our fifth and final Sunday dwelling within John chapter 6. And for four of those, we've been moving our way through Jesus' bread of life discourse that he gave at the synagogue in Capernaum. For most of us, the phrase bread of life is well known and often used in our churchly discourse, almost casually. But that was not the case for Jesus' listeners in the synagogue at Capernaum. For many, it would have been deeply offensive. And we read that the people complained and they grumbled. This is difficult. Who can accept it? Many simply turned and walked away that day. Have you ever considered the possibility that Jesus might well have preached more people out of the kingdom than into it? For some who walked away that day, I suspect that they couldn't consider anything other than a quite literal interpretation of Jesus' words. Unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? This is cannibalism. This is a, a grotesque abomination. To which some of us might respond, but wait a minute. This is clearly a reference to the Eucharist. Jesus is speaking of his presence in the Holy Communion. But if that's really the case, I, I don't know how Jesus could have expected his listeners to get it. Uh, the Last Supper, the event which Christians subsequently viewed as the first Eucharist, the first Holy Communion, of course it hadn't yet occurred. And the first record of a liturgical reenactment of that event in something resembling what we call Holy Communion is found in 1 Corinthians, which wasn't written until about 55 years after Jesus' death. Ah, but Bishop, you and I both know that the Gospel of John was probably written between 90 and 100 years after Jesus' death. Its authors would have been part of a Eucharistic community that was conversant with using these images in this way. Maybe in crafting the gospel, they were putting words in Jesus' mouth or perhaps phrasing them in such a way as to affirm their own churchly practices and theological constructs. Perhaps. And there are certainly some scholars who would support that particular interpretation. But when I look at the whole of John 6, that whole discourse, in the context of the whole Gospel of John, and when I look to a broad range of biblical scholars, I've come to a different conclusion. And I think what Jesus is really talking about here is incarnation. The Word, the Logos, about God entering into the life of God's own creation and becoming flesh. I think some of Jesus' listeners would have heard him saying that 
And it was that. It was that earth-shattering theological construct that they found to be at worst offensive and at best simply impossible to believe. I think that it was and still is almost unimaginable that God so loved the world, so loved God's creation, that God chooses to enter into that world, certainly in the person of Jesus of Nazareth, but also through Jesus into us, into God's beloved creation, so that we might have true and lasting life and have it abundantly. Luther's seminary theologian Carolyn Lewis describes it this way. This is truth, because at the end of the day, life, real life, life lived, abundant life, is hard to fathom, hard to accept, hard to imagine that it could be yours. Judas's betrayal that's referenced at the end of chapter 6 is fundamentally a rejection of relationship, but it's also an unwillingness to receive life beyond measure and inability to accept that abundant life could be true, a reluctance to envision, to dream, to picture that when God said God loves the world, that it actually meant him and means you. That's powerful. And it's that relationship, as intimate and nourishing as eating and drinking can be, that God in Christ entering into our lives into our existence. It is that that gives us both the will and the means to clothe and arm ourselves in the way that Paul describes to the Ephesians and to the Colossians. Our gospel lesson today concludes with Jesus asking a question to his disciples. Do you also wish to go away? Simon Peter answered him, Lord, to whom can we go? You have the words of eternal life. We have come to believe and know that you are the Holy One of God. May Peter's response be our response. Amen.